Hello folks, welcome to Edupedia World 9th grade computer applications video lecture series. I am Upeka Vandivona and from this episode we are bringing Unethical Computing Practices. We'll first start with the spams. Spam is the abuse of email systems to send unsolicited email to a large number of people. Most spam is a form of low-cost commercial advertising, sometimes for questionable products such as phonography, phony get-rich-quick schemes, and worthless stock. Spam is also an extremely inexpensive method of marketing used by many legitimate organizations. For example, a company might send email to a broad cross-section of potential customers to announce the release of a new product in an attempt to increase initial sales. When identifying spam, we can easily do that by analyzing the following areas in the email. The content of the email, the intent of the sender, and the consequences of the receiver, and the consent of the receiver, relationship between the sender and the receiver, accountability of the sender and the degree of deception, and finally the number of identical emails sent. So now let's look at the reasons why spamming is a highly used unethical practice in computing. The cost of creating an email campaign for a product or service is several hundred to a few thousand bucks compared with tens of thousands of bucks for direct mail campaigns. In addition, email campaigns take only a couple of weeks to develop, compared with three months or more for direct mail campaigns. And the turnaround time for feedback coverage, 48 hours for email as opposed to weeks for direct mail. However, the benefits of spam to companies can be largely offset by the public's generally negative reaction to receive unsolicited debts. Spam forces unwanted and often objectionable material into email boxes, detracts from the ability of recipients to communicate effectively due to full mailboxes and relevant emails being hidden among many unsolicited messages. And the cost internet users and service providers should afford will be millions of dollars annually. And spam is also used to deliver harmful worms and other malware. Most of the email service providers provide following mechanisms to give the protection from spams. Many companies, including Google, Microsoft, and Yahoo, offer free email services. Spammers often seek to use email accounts from such major free and reputable web-based email service providers as their spam can be sent at no charge and is less likely to be blocked. Spammers can defeat the registration process of the free email services by launching a coordinated bot attack that can sign up for thousands of email accounts. These accounts are then used by the spammers to send thousands of untraceable email messages for free. A partial solution to this problem is the use of CAPTCHA to ensure that only humans obtain free accounts. CAPTCHA Completely automated public Turing test to tell computers and humans apart. This software generates tests that humans can pass, but the most sophisticated computer programs cannot. For example, humans can read the distorted text in this image, but simple computer programs with image processing ability would not be able to do that. Okay, now the next topic is piracy. Piracy is a form of copyright infringement that involves making copies of software or enabling others to access software to which they are not entitled. In general form, we can define piracy as the using of technology in unauthorized ways a. to reproduce copies of proprietary information or b. distribute proprietary information across a computer network. The economic impact of systematic software piracy by organizations is far more significant than the impact of a few individuals copying their friend's program. From a moral point of view, however, if unauthorized copying of proprietary software is wrong, 
then it is just as wrong for individuals as it is for organizations interested in profiting from it. Information technology provides a new and highly profitable venue for cybercriminals who are attracted to use of information technology for its ease and reaching millions of potential victims. Cybercrime is another unethical computing practice. Cybercriminals are motivated by the potential for monetary gain and hacked into computers to steal, often by transferring money from one account to another to another, leaving a hopelessly complicated trial for law enforcement officers to follow. Cybercriminals also engage in all forms of computer fraud, stealing and reselling credit card numbers, personal identities and cell phone IDs, etc. Because the potential for monetary gain is high, they can afford to spend large sums of money to buy the technical expertise and access they need from unethical insiders. The use of stolen credit card information is a favorite ploy of computer criminals. Fraud rates are highest for merchants who sell downloadable software or expensive items such as electronics and jewelry. A high rate of disputed transactions known as chargebacks can greatly reduce a web merchant's profit margin. However, the permanent loss of revenue caused by lost customer trust has far more impact than the cost of fraudulent purchases and bolstering security. Most companies are afraid to admit publicly that they have been hit by online fraud or hackers because they don't want to hurt their reputation. To reduce the potential for online credit card fraud, most e-commerce websites use some form of encryption technology to protect information as it comes in from the consumer. Some also verify the address submitted online against the one the issuing bank has on file. But this way, the merchant may inadvertently throw out legitimate orders as a result. For example, a consumer might place a legitimate order but request shipment to another different address because it is a grift. Another security technique is to ask for a card verification value, CVV, the three-digit number above the signature panel on the back of a credit card. This technique makes it impossible to make purchases with a credit card number stolen online. An additional security option is transaction risk scoring software, which keeps track of a customer's historical shopping patterns and notes deviation from the norm. For example, let's say that you have never been into a five-star top-class hotel or there is no such a transaction with your credit card previously. So if your credit card information is being used at such a place, the transaction score would go up dramatically so much so that the transaction might be declined. The people who attack computer include thrill seekers wanting a challenge, common criminals looking for financial gain, and industrial spies trying to gain a competitive advantage, and terrorists seeking to cause destruction to further their cause. Each type of perpetrator has different objectives and access to varying resources, and each is willing to accept different levels of risk to accomplish his or her objective. Each perpetrator makes a decision to act in an unethical manner to achieve his or her own personal objectives. So let's take the first type of perpetrator, hackers, in this table. Hackers test the limitations of information systems out of intellectual curiosity to see whether they can gain access and how far they can go. They have at least a basic understanding of information systems and security features and much of their motivation comes from a desire to learn even more. The term hacker has evolved over the years, leading to its negative connotation today rather than the positive one it used to have. While there is still a vocal minority who believe the hackers perform a service by identifying security weaknesses, most people now believe that a hacker does not have the right to explore public or private networks. There are numerous types of computer attacks with new varieties being invented all the time. We usually think of such exploits being aimed at computers and smartphones. Increasingly, smartphone users store an array of personal identity information on their devices, including credit card numbers and bank account numbers. 
Smartphones are used to surf the web and also it can do business transactions electronically. The more people use their smartphones for these purposes, the more attractive these devices become as a target for cyber thieves. For example, ransomware is a form of malware which, when downloaded onto a smartphone, takes control of the device and its data until the owner agrees to pay a ransom to the attacker. Another form of smartphone malware runs up charges on users' accounts by automatically sending messages to numbers that charge fees upon receipt of a message. The first malicious intention we are going to talk about is viruses. Computer viruses has become an umbrella term for many types of malicious code. Technically, a virus is a piece of programming code, usually disguised as something else, that causes a computer to behave in an unexpected and usually undesirable manner. Often, a virus is attached to a file so that when the infected file is open, the virus executes. Other viruses sit in a computer's memory and infect files as the computer opens, modifies or creates them. Most viruses deliver a payload or malicious software that causes the computer to perform in an unexpected way. For example, the virus may be programmed to display a certain message on the computer's display screen, delete or modify a certain document, or reformat the hard drive. A true virus does not spread itself from computer to computer. A virus is spread to other machines when a computer user opens an infected email attachment, downloads an infected program, or visits infected website. In other words, viruses spread by the action of the infected computer user. The next item is computer worms. Unlike a computer virus, which requires users to spread infected files to another user, a worm is a harmful program that resides in the active memory of the computer and duplicates itself. Worms differ from viruses in that they can propagate without human intervention, often sending copies of themselves to other computers by email. The negative impact of a worm attack on an organization's computers can be considerable. Lost data and programs, lost productivity due to workers being unable to use their computers, additional lost productivity as workers attempt to recover data and programs, and lots of effort for IT workers to clean up the mess and restore everything to as close to normal as possible. The next one is Trojan Hose. A Trojan hose is a program in which malicious code is hidden inside a seemingly harmless program. The program's harmful payload might be designed to enable the hacker to destroy the hard drives, corrupt files, control the computer remotely, launch attacks against other computers, steal passwords or social security numbers, or spy on users by recording keystrokes and transmitting them to a server operated by a third party. A Trojan host can be delivered as an email attachment downloaded from a website or contracted via a removable media device. Once the user executes the program that hosts the Trojan host, the malicious payload is automatically launched with no telltale signs. Common host programs include screensavers, greeting cards and games. Another type of Trojan host is a logic bomb, which executes when it is triggered by a specific event. For example, logic bombs can be triggered by a change in a particular file, by typing a specific series of keystrokes, or by specific time or date. So that's all about unethical computing practices. If we have time, we can discuss much more than this, because when technology evolves, bad practices are evolving too. Therefore, what we have identified in here are few of most general ones. So, with this episode, we are going to wind up the third section, Computing and Ethics. And from the next lecture, we are going to start the fourth section, Office Application Software. Thank you for watching and see you in the next lecture. video brought to you by edupediaworld.com. Watch more from our website.